Now, normally you see a Scottish Ambulance Service staff going around in pairs, but here they've brought four of them, but that's a measure of your commitment to this topic. So thanks very much, Edith. I, I won't go into detail. I'm just going to invite Julie McCartney, Mary Monroe, and Lauren Slowey to come and speak to us. First of all, thank you very much uh, to Scottish Dogs Forum for having us along here today and really for all the kind of ongoing support that they've given us to get our projects within the ambulance service up and running. Um, so, um, you've got myself today, Julie McCartney, and my colleagues Mary Munro and Lauren Sloy. So you've got the tremendous trio today. Um, so a bit of a tough gig we're last on, however, hopefully we can keep you engaged for the next 20 minutes um, before you guys need to head off. So thanks for listening. So. What you can see on your screen here is an empty emergency ambulance. A blank canvas, if you like. And 18 months ago, when we joined a service, um, I guess we asked ourselves a couple of questions. What can the Scottish Ambulance Service do to improve the population health needs of people who use substances? And how can we turn our emergency response into a continuous care pathway for those affected by drug-related harm? So we've got about 700 um, A&E emergency response vehicles with limitless access to vulnerable communities and to patients who find services hard to reach, and that's come across a lot today. So we set out to explore our capabilities and as a national organisation, look at the kind of vast, kind of untapped potential that we've got to contribute to a reduction in drug-related deaths in Scotland. And the kind of uh, topics on the screen are what we're going to be talking you through today. So moving on, just a quick update on naloxone. So that was our first major project rollout, was to train 3,500 ambulance paramedics and technicians to be able to supply take-home naloxone to members of the public. Now, administering naloxone is something our crew do all the time, but the actual kind of prescribing of it or the supply of it to members of the public is obviously a very different matter. Um, and I can assure you that training 3,500 paramedics and technicians during a pandemic was quite the challenge, but we got there. Um, as you can see from the screen there, we've given out 1,668 kits, and that was as of the end of June. Um, and what is our reach? Who are we actually giving these kits to? Because I think it's really important that people know, um, you know the actual kind of untapped market that we potentially have in terms of patient groups. So 36% of our take-home naloxone kits went to friends and family. 35% have gone direct to the patient. 28% have gone to service workers, and we have a small 1% unknown, not recorded, most likely due to, due to some kind of teething problems at the beginning of the project with uh, recording. And then supply type, again, which is quite important because it does uh, kind of give you a bit more of a deeper analysis of the actual um, you know, people we're coming across. So 65% of the kits that we've given out have been to people who've never had one before. So there were first supplies, which again, I think does really emphasise the, the unique reach that we do have in vulnerable communities to make sure people who need a take-home naloxone kit can get one. 20% of the kits we've given out have been repeat supplies. And on deeper analysis of that, 74% of those repeat supplies were due to the previous kit having been used to reverse an overdose. 9% of our supply types were, were unknown, again, just some initial uh, teething problems with recording, and 6% were given out as a spare supply. So moving on from the lock zone, we were kind of tasked with uh, the creation of a non-fatal overdose pathway. So this was really the fact that we recognised that we do have a vital role to play in connecting patients who experience a non-fatal overdose to support in their local communities for aftercare and follow-up support. So over the last year, we've developed um, and established a daily uh, sharing process with all 14 health boards in Scotland. And this data sharing pathway identifies patients who are at future risk of harm or death due to their use of opiates and or benzodiazepines. So you can see from the graph on your screen there that within the last year we have um, shared information on 7,214 incidents. Now some health boards didn't come on board with the data sharing process till about October, November last year, so we don't quite have a full year of, of data, so we do anticipate that that will be higher in the next calendar year. But again, it does just show um, the, you know, the amount of, of incidents that we are attending. And again, you can obviously see on the screen the different health board areas there where the information is going to. What we do know, and Lauren's going to talk a little bit more about this um, later on, that some of the preliminary evidence that's coming back from the overdose response teams that are acting on this information 
about 40% of the patients, so 40% of these 7,214 incidents, these patients are, were not currently working with a drug or alcohol treatment service, so they were not receiving any form of treatment or support. Again, showing you that kind of unique reach um, that the ambulance service has to identify people who really are at high risk. We know that engagement and treatment um, is a protective factor against drug-related death, and obviously we can maximise and highlight people who are highly at risk. And the last slide for me um, is about our kind of, um, I guess, the launch of our new pathway hub. So from the last slide, you could see that our non-fatal overdose pathway, which is an automatic daily sharing process, is only sensitive to patients who are at risk of their use of opiates or benzodiazepines. So what about patients who don't use those types of substances, but are still at risk of harm from the substances that they do use, and that includes alcohol? So we set out to make sure that we can make every single healthcare connection count with the patients that we work with. And we could be responding to a patient not for a drug-related concern, it could be some other general physiological health problem. But through our assessment of that patient, we do know that they use substances. We want to make sure we capture every single opportunity to ensure people get the support that they need. So we've set up a single point of contact for all ambulance crew, regardless of time of day, day of week, uh, and wherever they're geographically located across the country. It's a single point of contact telephone number that crew can call. And at the end of that phone, we have our pathway hub team that will then direct that crew to the service closest to where that patient lives and that um, obviously can offer them support with any issues regarding drugs and alcohol. We've established connections with 26 different drug and alcohol treatment services, which covers the whole of Scotland. So there's no postcode lottery with this. Regardless of where somebody stays, we have made a connection that the ambulance service can refer to get that individual help and support. And finally, it does embed the principles of shared decision-making and realistic medicine. So that's obviously from an ambulance per um, service perspective. Essentially, what we mean there is it's extremely patient-focused. We're looking to maximise every opportunity to ensure that patients get the help and support that they need and they get the right care at the right time for them, regardless of where they live in the country. I'm now going to hand you over to Mary, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the other projects that we've been working on. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so, yeah... I think, as Julie's kind of highlighted, we were originally employed for the Naloxone programme and for the non-fatal overdose pathways, and I think it's safe to say they're pretty much embedded in the service, so as we know, we're like, right, what else can we get stuck into? Um, so I'm going to talk a wee bit about that. So some of the, uh, pretty much every single meeting, when I think we can all reflect on when we started, we just kept hearing, and we've talked about this today, hard to reach people who use drugs are hard to reach, which is absolutely just not the case, and we would fully subscribe to that. Um, the Scottish Ambulance Service attend about 21,000 incidences a year for people who use substances, at least, um, and we really wanted to kind of reinforce that to the services that we are working with, our partners, and just say, look, these individuals are not hard to reach, that by saying that you're putting that onto that person and actually not that accountability we spoke about at the start, that's not giving accountability to the services and the barriers and the stigma that people face. So. Yeah, so we kind of thought, right, what else can we do? What can we get involved with? So here's a couple of projects we've kind of started out on. The first is, obviously, we provide naloxone, um, and we've had a lot of crews come to us and say around going, going to attendance and people who had used um, injecting equipment um, provision and shared that amongst themselves. Some people asking for equipment from crews because they don't have those access. So I'm pleased to say we've, we're starting to embed that within the service, that the service will start to provide alongside naloxone injecting equipment provision. Um, and I think we kind of call it, it just makes sense. If people are asking for it, if we're in people's homes, we have that unique reach, then we absolutely could be and should be providing that. We've also got another project um, similar to the kind of wand project up in Grampian that's starting uh, with a patient transport emergency vehicle um, with bloodborne virus testing. IEP, wound care assessment, naloxone, uh, lived and living experience, third sector organisations, and really just trying to go to the areas that's needed and support people into the right support at the right time. Um, as we've discussed many, many times today, stigma, huge issue, not going to shy away from that. It's absolutely in the service and we absolutely need to do something about it. Um, so some of the ways we've tried to do that um, I think we need to give nod to our emergency service colleagues. They've never had any training on substance use, on mental health, or if they have, it was about half an hour, four years ago. That's ultimately what we hear. Um, so this is all new to them, this kind of public health approach. 
Um, so we're trying to create spaces and giving people opportunities to think about drugs, alcohol, mental health, substance use, addiction differently. Some of the ways we've done that is through the bespoke training and the Scottish Drug Forum sessions, um, particularly around wound care, um, signposting to the SDF resources. I'm pleased to say that we're embedding our undergraduate programmes just about there and all our undergraduate programmes having that public health lens. So all our new clinicians will now be trained um, with that public health um, approach, as well as our student technician courses as well and starting to look at student paramedic placements to drug treatment and support services as well. Um, I think for all of us in the team, this has been a huge, huge priority as um, individuals with lived and living experience. Again, we've heard about the power of that and the importance of it today. Um, we didn't want it to be tokenistic either. So whenever we've delivered any sort of training, we've really tried to involve people as much as possible who have that lived and living experience. Um, people who are in active addiction, asking about their experiences when a um, clinician's attended, how did that look? Thinking about individuals who are in recovery. Um, so we have to remember again, our clinicians are just seeing people at their worst. They're seeing people in overdose continuously. They're not seeing recoveries possible. They don't, they don't see that. So to have um, individuals in recovery, peer support, it's fantastic that they can come and share their journeys with, with staff. Um, another voice that we are very keen to and have been trying to embed is the voice of families as well. Um, as Julie has noted, a huge percentage of the naloxone kits going out is to family members um, who are often on scene, who are often worried about their loved one. Um, so we've done a big piece of work with lovely Suze over there, um, promoting SFAD um, and how we can get crews to, um, I suppose, refer family members in to support them, to support their loved one. Um, and I ultimately try and, um, I suppose, we're working towards being a trauma-informed approach. As I said, I think it's a quite a, it's a big ask for the service just now. Um, they're very medical medical model. That's how they've been trained. Um, but we are making steps when it, whether it's working with people who use substances or um, and not naloxone administration. Um, ultimately, I think I just want to thank many people in this pitch, in these pictures. But ultimately, we wouldn't be able to do half of what we do without partnership working. Um, sharing those perspectives, sharing those uh, knowledge, understanding, that, that's, that's where we've got, that's where we see ourselves going. Um, no one, not one single person in this room or service is going to be able to change things alone. It's got to be everyone together. Um, so for me, it's about connection, compassion and care. And that's what we've seen from other services. And uh, hopefully we'll see much more in the ambulance service. Thank you very much. So I get the, the fabulous job of taking you through what has actually been a very complex process um, and trying to sort of put that across just in a couple of slides. So Julie and Mary have both touched on the, the issues around the, the medical model and, and you know how we generally talk about people being hard to reach. And so that is where our data journey starts with SAS. Um, you know, the first thing that we find is that SAS being a very data rich service, very quickly and early on into the journey of the overdose response pathway, let us see that people are not hard to reach. The ambulance service sees them every single day. So this is just a, a representation of the, the kind of 40-60 divide that you generally see and that national figure has been fairly consistent from inception through till now um, in terms of the people that we send across in the overdose response pathway. Um, but just to be very clear, we do very much need continued support from partners so that we can make sure that the, the data is responsive enough. So people that are sent down this pathway are picked up through data flags and that can only happen if we are responsive to what is actually happening um, for individuals you know, what the complex needs are, what the demographics are. Um, so we very much appreciate the support from our alcohol drug partnerships and from our health and social care partnerships in identifying the, the unmet needs of individuals. Now, many of you will already have seen the kind of mapping that we do in the ambulance service. We do tend to present these at um, alcohol and drug partnership meetings when it's appropriate. Um, and probably some of the, the postcodes that present here, you'll not be surprised, are the, the highest kind of drug um, overdose response areas that the ambulance service attend. Now, we started presenting this and recognising that drug death statistics were often presented in terms of the areas where people die most often, but that actually we can present some information about where people actually experience near fatal events most often as well. They, most, they do regularly match up quite well, um, you know, similar areas, but we found it quite important in terms of thinking about a, a response model. 
Um, so certainly what's been very helpful here, if you think about taking away the chaos, we've been able to go and sort of map some of the similar things that they find about where people travel from and to to use substances in public places um, and times of the day that, that incidents happen. So we're hoping in future to, to support services to identify where, when and who should provide the services for safer drug consumption facilities. Now, we wanted to do a bit of a deeper dive into our data, find out a little more, um, but before we did that, we thought it's going to be quite important that we actually trust the data sets that we're looking at. Now, this is just one example of one of the parameters that we've had a quick look at to see who is it that we are actually finding when we're looking at near fatal incidents. And I think if you have a quick look at those age bandings, you might see some similarities in those that we identify as being most at risk of drug-related death. So in having a bit more confidence around the data sets, we decided, let's have a look at that bit that's missing. We pick patients up after overdose, and we know that there's a national figure of around 75 to 85% of people that we do actually take to hospital following that. That might shock some of you, but that has been quite a consistent figure. Then our overdose response teams, we send them the information, and they respond. But what happens after we drop the person off at hospital before the overdose response team go? So we wanted to be able to find out a bit more information about that missing part of a journey. So we have been able to start looking at what, um, emergency department duration contact. Um, and quite surprised, that, well I was quite surprised anyway, to find that most people were spending somewhere between 2 and 12 hours in the emergency departments. It's a huge amount of time, um, you know, a very vulnerable moment for an individual and might actually act as that moment that we can intervene where someone who has compassion, has time and has knowledge of the local services might be that partner to sit alongside them during that moment. So you see as well that actually the, the highest reason for discharge from emergency department is not because the person decided to leave or because um, you know, they were told to, to, to get on, they didn't have any sort of medical reasons to be there, but actually because they were admitted to wards. So again, we're having this deeper dive into data that's letting us have a look at where are the right moments to intervene. So again, this will be some information we'll bring along to alcohol and drug partnership meetings so that we can explore who is responsible for those moments and how can we connect people to the right services at the very right time. So beyond that, we wanted to start thinking about how we then move that model of responding to individuals who have already experienced overdose. So taking from response to responsive. How do we find individuals before they experience overdose? How do we find them when they present to services with multiple complex needs? We've already proven the ambulance service finds people, we engage with the hard to reach, we see them every day. So how can we find them earlier before they have had to experience significant harm? So again, went into a bit of a deeper dive in some data sets. And we used a cohort of individuals who had experienced non-fatal overdose so we could go back and have a look through um, engagement patterns with the ambulance service. Now you'll see, well, 36% had no previous contact with the ambulance service. The majority of individuals have had at least either one other contact, but sometimes up to more than 20 contacts with emergency um, services. And a number of those reasons you'll see that fit quite the profile of other multiple complex needs. You know, we've had things like COPD, falls, all of these other socioeconomically driven conditions that we know we see individuals for when they eventually attend for addiction treatment support. So we're hoping in future to harness that data, to harness that knowledge and to bring it to our partners so that we can create some change at the right time before people have to experience significant harm. And just a note, obviously, talking about data, talking about statistics, it's numbers this, numbers that, but very much when we talk about data in the ambulance service, we recognise that every figure does represent an individual whose life matters. Thank you. And that's our contact information if anyone does want to get in touch.